I bought some Legos. I love Legos. Everybody loves Legos. But why did I buy them? To build architecture. I have some experience with this. I've been building with Legos ever since I was a kid. But I also think that everyone who studied architecture probably says that. I went to school in the early 2000s, and uh, since then I've even helped budding young high school students realize their Lego architecture in a workshop. This one was my favorite. This is the one that my partner Allison built. It's a gateway. A couple of years later, the Museum of Science and Industry in Chicago asked Alice and I to design and build a construction to feature Legos and the power of play as a gateway to creating greatness. So we built a gateway. Our gateway was displayed alongside the creations of Adam Reed Tucker, a certified professional Lego builder. His constructions included a 60-foot Golden Gate Bridge, the International Space Station, and the Roman Colosseum. Our gateway didn't seem so monumental anymore. But this all got me thinking, why do Legos and architecture go so well together? That's why I bought this set, to build some stuff and to see what kind of architectural lessons are lurking inside of some of these blocks. It's no surprise that toys are important to developing creative young minds. Frank Lloyd Wright famously attributes his early architectural explorations to Froebel blocks, a wooden set of blocks that are cut with specific proportions that help guide budding creators with a system for adding elements together in particular ways held together by gravity. Frank Lloyd Wright's son would go on to invent Lincoln Logs, a system of notched wood logs that can be assembled into basic cabin shapes. The No Toy franchise has been more successful in inspiring young architects than Legos. Its combination of simple rules, its almost infinite freedom, and the colorful possibilities are a kind of mysteriously perfect storm of providing lessons that translate into architecture. Of course, these qualities also make them good at creating more than just buildings. Legos can be used to make cars, spaceships, characters in movies, TV shows, or cartoons. And you can make bridges, boats, trees, and even paintings. You name it, and you can probably make it out of Legos. They provide a universal system to make anything that you can imagine. This makes them particularly good at world making. They offer a common set of rules and units for building totalizing environments. There's a concept lurking in architecture called total design, where people like Walter Gropius are advocates for a total architecture, where the architect is authorized to design everything, from the teaspoon to the city. Of course, Frank Lloyd Wright is also a proponent of this, where he designs chairs and cities as well. This kind of reminds me of Lego movies, where everything in the world depicted in the film is made of Legos. But of course, the movie is CGI, so it's not really Legos, just digital reproductions of them. But that doesn't matter. We can hold a Lego in our hand and witness the same brick come to life on the movie screen. It's almost like this little brick is a key between fantasy and reality. Because of course there are real buildings that are built like Legos. A Lego piece is called a brick that can be used like bricks would be used in a building. But real buildings are like Lego constructions in a wide variety of other related ways as well. The architecture firm Bjarke Ingels Group designed a building especially for the display, exhibition, and interaction with Legos. Of course, the building itself looks like it could have been designed using a model from Lego bricks. Each gallery is like a block intersected with other blocks. Legos are first and foremost a lesson in modularity. A single unit is dictated by the size and the spacing of the, the stud here. Pieces are then identified by how many studs they have, so this one is 1 by 3. Once the stud size is determined, it has a ripple effect that basically dictates the size of everything else. Of course, the anti-stud underneath has to be a certain size to accept the stud, and on and on. The building industry is also based on modularity. Of course, it's a bit more complicated than having a single stud, because buildings are made out of an assemblage of lots of different materials. But actually, the modularity is what allows for the easy bringing together of different materials. For instance, brick walls are often built of two layers. The interior layer is made of CMU units, or concrete masonry units. The standard size of CMU units is designed to be three bricks tall. This makes it easy to put things like doors and windows without the need to cut anything. Also things like plywood are designed to match the wood stud spacing of 16 inches apart, and so on. But modularity goes even deeper than that in architecture. During the video that I made on geometry, I talked about the diameter of, say, a Greek column as an important unit in a building like a temple. However, in places like Japan, the system of modularity is called the ken, which dictates the size of rooms as multiples of how many tatami mats can be laid on the ground. A companion to modularity is proportion. Lego units are square in plan at 8 millimeters, but are 9.6 millimeters tall, making it 1.2 times its width. A plate is one third of a brick in height. And these are the proportional relationships expressed as ratios. Of course, proportion is also extremely important to architecture. The fixed size of the unit also allows us to talk about something like resolution. 
For instance, if I try to make a small circle using standard blocks, it's only roughly approximately a circle. But if I build a larger circle, I can actually get a little bit closer to the curvature that a circle would have. The bigger one has a higher degree of resolution because I can use more bricks to build it. And the pixel size isn't so big in relationship to the overall shape that I'm trying to make. This relates to the amount of imagination that I need in order to fill in the gaps. For instance, it's pretty hard to pretend that a low resolution one is actually a circle. It's heavily relying on me to do a lot of that work in my head. But the high, re high resolution circle is much closer and it doesn't need me to fill in as much detail. Architecture is described like this too. Buildings like the Pacific Design Center in Los Angeles could be said to be low resolution. It's really big, but it's like it doesn't have the amount of detail that we'd expect for a building of its size. It's just a single shape with some angles and a circle. This would be in contrast to say a Baroque building, which would be very high resolution. Every surface is covered with folds and bends and detail. A low resolution building requires us to use our imagination to pretend what it could be. And some people even call it the blue whale. Maybe because it has a fin? But the San Carlino building is crusted with recognizable figures like people and architectural elements like moldings. Low resolution things are fun to guess what they look like. Because of the low resolution, they look like a lot of other things. So, I don't know, what is this? It's like a little guy, like, chomping at me. Ah. In addition to these ideas around modularity is the fact that there's a logic that dictates how the units are put together. So with Lego, we stack bricks. We can cantilever them, but we need a special piece to be able to go sideways. We might call this logic of assembly a grammar, the same way that you would use the word to describe a language, where grammar are the rules of assembly for the way that words go together. Architecture is often talked about as being a language or like a language. And grammar is a good way of thinking about the rules for how things go together. In all languages, even computer languages, there are increasing scales of packets of information with rules for how the packets go together. In spoken language, we have sounds, sounds go together to make words, words go together to make sentences, and sentences to paragraphs, and so on. Architecture might also work like this. A brick makes a wall, which makes a room, which makes a building. And materials have a grammar of assembly, um, as well as rooms have a grammar in a building. Putting bricks together is largely an additive process. You start with zero bricks and you build up a design. But subtractive strategies, on the other hand, are where you have a volume of something that has a clear shape and you subtract a piece from it. it this would be a simple cube, like a whole cube, if it weren't for this one piece taken away. This is also a useful way for talking about buildings, and buildings like the Lego building by Bjarke Ingels is additive. Let's say their tech center is like a cube with a hole board through it. Legos also teach us about color blocking and color composition. Of course, colors can be chosen in order to be realistic, but they might also create a graphic on an object that adds another layer of understanding. You might build stripes or randomly colored bricks like this, or polka dots, and they all give a different impression uh, within a wall of Legos. Of course, color is also an important aspect of architecture, with people like Louis Barragan famously used color in his buildings that were deeply rooted in Mexican culture. These colors created different interior atmospheres of colored light. But also color is important as large graphics on buildings and techniques of application like super graphics, where large scale patterns or graphic information is applied with paint or other processes. These colors can activate otherwise undifferentiated walls or create dizzying effects. Of course all of this is possible because Legos are open-ended. They come with instructions that allow you to make something specific, but you can also improvise by either altering an intended design or creating one from scratch. People can choose the level of engagement, whether they want to follow the rules or express their own individuality. And you can always take something apart and start over again. The pieces aren't permanently altered through their configuration. In architecture, there are varying levels of this idea. Most building materials are wasted after demolition. However, there are some interesting experiments in reconfigurable or reusable materials. And of course, there are examples like the Issei Shrine in Japan that is made of wood, solid cypress, and doesn't use any nails or fasteners. And the building is rebuilt every 20 years and has been for centuries. The actual process of construction takes eight years each time, and the last rebuild in 2013 cost half a billion dollars. I'm also reminded of shipping container buildings. There's been a big push since around the 1990s to make buildings out of used shipping containers. There have been quite a few good ones too. The containers are reusable and can almost stack like Legos. The unit size for them is a little strange for architecture though, because they're only about 8 feet or 2.43 meters wide, which is a really tight space for a room. They're also not easy to insulate, and when you cut them for openings, they lose some of their structural capacity. Really should be knolling this. But that's not how I roll.
Build some spatial awareness. Oh. There, that's my house. You've seen what architecture I can make with Legos. What can you make? 